So I played The Witcher 3's Blood and Wine DLC, I mean, Siege of Paris, and I think I liked it a lot more than most people did. Since I didn't love Valhalla, I can't say I went into Siege with high expectations. So many people were hoping for this to be THE Creed DLC, the one where Eivor becomes a full-blooded assassin. In the words of the 43rd President of the United States of America, Fool me once, shame on Shame on you. It fooled me, we can't get fooled again. I wasn't holding my breath because Wrath of the Druids didn't do that, so I didn't expect Siege to either. But I did expect Siege to take me to a new place, meet new characters, collect new gear, do mostly the same stuff in slightly different ways. It's safe to say the formula with Valhalla also involves showing the assassins for like five seconds just to know that they're there. But you know, hurry up, go on and do Viking stuff. This is a bite-sized version of the Valhalla experience. And if you're into that and everything that it involves, I see no reason why you wouldn't like this, especially if you hadn't touched the game in a few months like me. But that's not the whole story because I ended up liking Siege a lot more than Wrath of the Druids. Halfway through, I realized it wasn't just keeping my attention, it actually made me care. I mean, I can't remember the last time I stopped for two minutes straight to make a choice in a DLC, and that counts for something. For me, this works because of solid writing and solid performances from its main characters. Toka, Charles, Richardus, Odo, Siegfried, they all convinced me. Well, everyone except for Bernard. What is, what is wrong with children in this video game? Even Eivor has this moment of reflection that felt way more authentic than anything in the main game. I knocked Valhalla's story because it felt too long for me and the performances weren't consistent. Siege strikes this balance where it feels like these characters matter and the tighter narrative made up for most of the problems that I would have had. I have a lot more to say about this story, but it's going to involve spoilers. So stick around till the end of the video for that. Outside of the main plot, Siege can feel really goofy and that's just a Valhalla thing to me. Giant scythes, pig races, cheese throwing, this guy. When the great bear was sleeping, the gestures went creeping. You can summon plague rats and do this. Some of these French accents are downright heinous. This is our silver they were trying to take. Oh, he took her, my daughter. The damn thief promised a jug of wine to guard her warehouse. It sounds like they hired the but I'm lit tired guy from End of the World. It's weird because the main cast did a great job. The accents were subtle and fit the rest of the game. Everyone else though, sounds like they used one of these to smoke 400 cigarettes a day. Oh, 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 oui, oui, uh, mon chéri. There's also these plague rat puzzles, which I'm all for unique ideas that fit the air and the setting but guiding these rats felt frustrating more often than not. And all it did was remind me of how good a Plague Tale Innocence was. Seriously guys, that game is amazing. Please play it, it's on Game Pass. Siege also reminded me of how much I don't like this combat. One-handed swords are great and all, but there's no rhythm here. It feels like I'm fighting with two left hands. And don't even get me started on these horse knight, this new enemy. This is not fun. I ended up sleep arrow and then assassinating everyone to skip combat entirely, which felt cheap, but that's how done I was. It doesn't help that detection is still broken. It works sometimes, but then it just decides not to. And that means you can't plan for when Pierre, 50 yards away, decides, oh, he can see you and alerts everyone. So when I got detected, I just ran away because I didn't want to slog through more of the combat. Even the bugs in this game don't want me to be sneaky. I played Siege of Paris about a week late. So I saw a lot of people saying Frankia looks too much like England. And I actually don't feel that way. I had to make the blood and wine joke earlier, but <laughs> seriously, I did enjoy running through this world. Paris and the surrounding villages, they feel believable and even surprised me with some of the details. Since I played Unity recently, I couldn't help but compare Paris to see how these cities lined up. The way you follow Richardus here is just a great use of space, putting the church in the background to draw your eye while contrasting the flowers in the foreground. And oh, sorry, I didn't mean to read my thesis on art and video games. The TLDR version, Frankia is gorgeous, even the war-torn depressing parts. Maybe it's because I'm more patient and I haven't played since Wrath, but I came away really liking this setting. Part of my enjoyment has to do with how I played this DLC. Going in, I decided I'm not doing anything I didn't like from Valhalla. The golden chest hiding in that house? No. That glowing dot on the minimap? Mm -mm. 
This time I just said, no, 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 hell no. The weariness I felt from the main game is still hanging over me. But after not playing since Wrath, it felt liberating to put all of that open worldy crap aside and just do what's fun to me. I saved all of those junk food activities for after the story when I could just zone out and go on autopilot. And that's what I ended up doing for most of the content outside of the main path. I wasn't up for another game of, okay, how the hell do I get in this house to collect upgrade materials that I don't need? Rebel missions are the big new activity and they're kind of like flaming hot Cheetos. They taste good at first, so you keep eating them until you realize you've got a real code brown on your hands. After Wrath's Pigeon Coops, I knew Yubi was trying to deliver on that classic feeling of doing missions through contacts, but these just feel like chores to me. Collect another currency, fill another meter, unlock more gear. When you gamify content like this in the same way over and over again, it's just easy to see through. It loses something. So I didn't end up finishing these because there's just way too many to max out that meter. Another big selling point for the DLC is black box assassinations. The first few, I was like, eh, these seem forced. You do these brutal assassinations that not only don't seem deserved for characters I didn't really know, but they kind of felt like a cheap Tarantino trick, but as I kept playing, they became more open-ended and in larger areas and kind of grew on me. The last two in particular are awesome. One of them feels like you're playing a level of Hitman. They also left me wondering why weren't these in the main game? This mission structure works without any real connection to the assassin fantasy. It's still fun. so. Now that we've seen that it works, it feels like a missed opportunity on the other side. It's time for the main event, the actual Siege of Paris. I also heard bad things about this, but to me, it felt like a better version of the fortress assaults in England. You do a couple of prep missions to get ready, leading up to that final like large scale battle. Fighting in Paris while the city burns is genuinely cool. It's a cool moment. Plus, the battle itself lasts a long time, lots of stuff actually happens in the story, so it carries the weight of the moment. To me, it delivers on what I thought assaults were going to be like in the main game. I don't want to talk too much more about it because spoilers, but yeah, I thought the siege was cool. This DLC gives just the same amount of attention to the hidden ones as the main game. You gather keys from a couple of hideouts to open a bureau where the assassins operated. They spared no expense building out these chambers, but too bad you weren't born hundreds of years earlier to see what it was like at its height. I don't know, guys. By this point, these feel like Easter eggs, and it's just kind of sad. It's like you're keeping one foot in the water and the other out. And for the second DLC in Valhalla, it feels like one too many, hey, look, we put the assassins in. We did the thing. At the very end, a hidden one sneaks in and leaves you a letter, and Abor says, Let all the hidden ones left rank here. I will not find them if they do not want to be found. But I will honor their gift. If we needed a final nail in the coffin, this is it. Eivor will not be a hidden one. It's just not happening, guys. And that's fine. It is. It's just that this isn't satisfying to me as someone who grew up with the older games. This doesn't work for me. Before we hop into spoilers, I just want to put a bow on overall thoughts. I really liked this DLC. Even with the issues I have, it felt like time well spent, and you don't always get that out of DLC. And for a game that I said I was ultimately disappointed by, for a lot of other reasons, yeah, this was a very pleasant surprise. It showed me a side of Valhalla that I actually did enjoy quite a lot in a way that I hadn't really seen before. It probably sounds weird hearing that because I've done my fair share of complaining, but yeah, the story really was that good. So if you're cool listening to spoilers, let's get into it. Eivor gets recruited to raid Paris and stop the Mad King Charles the Fat, whose conquest might just take him to England next. But also, there's whispers of another cult. After Wrath, Eivor is basically Dog the Bounty Hunter, but for cults. Call this guy up and he'll take care of your ancient cult problem, no questions asked. In all seriousness, this works. It makes sense for Eivor. The opening scene sailing past burning bodies, yeah. I didn't realize it at the time, but this is where the DLC had my curiosity. For the rest of the runtime, you navigate alliances with Siegfried and Toka's clan, you uproot the Bellatoris Day cult, and you figure out some way to deal with Charles. These storylines all manage to overlap, and for the most part, it's pretty convincing. I think what sold me the most was these characters, because I fell head over heels for a lot of them. But not at first. Siegfried, he runs around like this, and he ends up slaughtering women and children because bloodlust, but I loved his final decision to leave the clan to Toka. It felt poetic for him to lay down his arms after making mistakes and realizing 
his time is over. I almost cried gamer tears. Charles the Fat is an incredible character. The first scene with him in the brothel had some major Job of the Hut vibes, but I kind of love the parlay sort of thing that Eivor has with Charles throughout the narrative. It's very similar to Alfred in the main game, but you actually get to see and interact with Charles way more. I also love witnessing his downfall, how he is literally the Mad King who ends up being the beast his son references. I love the final decision. This is the one that I spent several minutes on deciding like, do I spare this guy or not? In the end, I had to kill him. There's no way I could trust this guy to honor his word after betraying us. And there's no amount of medieval therapy that was going to stop him from flying off the wheel again and killing more innocent people in his madness. Anyways, clearly when I'm thinking about and considering decisions and characters this much in a video game, it's a sign that it really got me. I loved it. When you meet Richardus and Bernard, that's really the moment where this DLC hooked me. Valhalla spends a lot of time trying to convince me its characters believe in a higher power. Most of the time it doesn't work, but it does with Richardus her values, her perspective of being Charles's wife by circumstance, of protecting Bernard while also wanting to spare Charles. In the end, I disagreed with her appeal for mercy, but also, holy sh**, this character really resonated with me, which is another reason the final scene with Charles paid off. I wanted to save her, and then I wanted to go and kill Charles. Count Odo is another great character for me. An extremely passionate guy who Eivor respects and shares values with, but who happens to be on the other side of the conflict. It was really cool to fight this guy and then turn around and realize the circumstances of the situation had changed and pretty much it made sense to ally with him. After all, Eivor's goal is peace and he gets that with Count Odo. In the end, I feel like I made some satisfying progress for Eivor and the clan, you know, secured a strong ally in Toka, took care of Charles, ended the Bellator estate cult and, you know, pacifying France for now. Mission accomplished. I don't know what else to say. It just works. Even Eivor had an awesome moment. My jaw dropped when he referenced his mom and dad before the siege. <laughs> like I just don't remember any moment in the main game where I really connected with Eivor on a deeper level. It's like, yeah, you did lose your parents. I mean, that must have been rough. And thank you for bringing that up so I actually care about you. Outside of strong characters and moments, I think this story works so well for me because of the nature of DLC in general. Instead of stretching this thing across, I don't know, 60 hours and having me meet like 30 characters in different locations, none of which I get to know all that well, this feels better, it feels more intimate. I felt like I really got to know Toka, Siegfried, Richardus, Charles, and Odo. I also learned something new about Eivor. It also just doesn't have any of the mystical stuff in the story, which, uh, that's where I think Wrath lost me. Like I said before, I was surprised with this story and I liked it enough for me to forgive a lot of the other parts of the DLC that didn't land for me. Like this, I cannot believe that I opened up my map I was looking for something. I was looking for the next objective. And instead of finding that on my map, I get this, this full screen ad. This is a pop-up. I'm lucky enough to have gotten a review code for this, but if I paid $25 and this popped up on my screen, oh, it's just frustrating. That's it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the review. Uh, thanks to UB for the code. I was happy to check this out, and yeah, I'm glad that I enjoyed it. I would love to hear what you guys think about Siege in the comments below, because I think I'm truly in the minority here. I think more people didn't like this than liked it. Uh, maybe that's just my Twitter sphere or whatever. So, let me know what you guys think. If you enjoyed the video and you wanna see more from me, hit the subscribe button. You can also hit the bell for a chance that YouTube sends you my next video. It's really just a dice roll. Um, you really don't know if they're gonna do it or not. You just kinda of have to hope. I'm really excited for you guys to see my next video. I kinda of wanna keep it a secret, so hope you are hyped for that. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.